So, now let us continue the, the topic. First, let us get into the central nervous system. Central nervous system that it contains a maximum number of neurons within a human body. Out of 12 billion neurons, 9 billion are there in the central nervous system. And central nervous system consists of the brain and our spinal cord. So, these two they form the central nervous system and the neurons are there, they are actually within this, they are called the interneurons. And different part of that this central nervous system or the this the brain, they are responsible for different work. The frontal part, this frontal lobe that is responsible for intelligence, that occipital lobe that is for the, the vision, parietal lobe for sensation and our the motor action, then medulla it is actually looking for the autonomous different kind of actions like breathing that our uh, contraction or regulation of our heart. So, different part is responsible for different kind of activity and it is encased in a very safe way that we have the skull covering this and we have the spinal cord is also actually within encased in the bones. However, that does not make it disconnected from the outside the some of the cells they are for example, the motor one that they have the connection that is going out and the same way from the sense organs that the neurons they are getting in and terminating in the spinal cord. So, that is the way it actually collects the signal throughout the body and it can also uh, that control the actions throughout the body. And that uh, this interconnection of neuron they have a lot of interesting features. In the experiment it is found that if one part is damaged then slowly the other parts they take up that responsibility or start doing that job. So, it is peculiar that what we call that healing up actual healing may not happen in the brain, but part of the other part of the brain is reprogrammed to do those activity of the impaired region. And that is why it is told that our brain a very small part of it only we are using for our work and it has enormous capacity to actually store the information to process the information and to give commands. So, that is a brief overview about the that the brain and the signal what we get out of it we call as EEG or electroencephalogram. Now, let us go for the connections that how we are actually going to collect this signal. So, here we have given a that template that uh, a template is given here on the board that how the the cords are connected to record the signal and in the same way we have some points here. The two ear lobes they are marked as A 1 and A 2, they acts as a reference. And if you look at this is the, the skull, 
we call this electrical that uh, collection system it is called 1020 electrode placement system. So, why this name? If we look at that how the configurations are that if we take two axes are there one axis is passing that from the left to the, the right ear lobe from that left to right that is one axis another axis passing from the nose tip to that that this point the back of that union that back of the that brain. So, that is another axis. So, in both the axis we are actually placing some electrodes. So, if we look at first that that the end point of the nose to that union after 10 degree. So, this this two if we take a, it as a hemisphere. So, this is about 180 degree apart. So, after 10 degree we have a electrode placed then after 20 degree apart we have another. So, this is the way um, that we have the electrodes are connected. So, and the, this is the, the way that uh, looking at the length that after that 10 percent then 20 percent then 20 percent in that way the electrodes are placed. Same way in between the distance between the two ear lobes that if we take that like this if we go like this both the side just like a headphone. So, the connections are done in that way again uh, and if we look at sidewise also that 10 percent 20 percent that proportion is maintained and these two axes they form a grid and those grid points we place the electrodes and they are marked as that uh, that F or T or C different names they are given. So, that is the way they are marked. This is the ECG panel where the, the signal are acquired for that one patient. So, when we are talking about the ECG signal we need to talk about also we need to specify that what lead we have used to collect that signal. Otherwise, that the description of that EEG signal remains incomplete. Now, let us look at some configuration. First, we look at the unipolar EEG recording configuration. In this configuration, that we know unipolar means that we are taking one pole for that connection here it could be O2 it could be here it could be O2 or it could be that F8. So, it could be any of this point and the reference is taken from the two ear lobes the mid potential of the two ear lobes are taken as the reference and they are fed to the amplifier to collect the, the signal. So, we would tell that that unipolar configuration O2 we have collected or we have collected it from F P 2 or F 8 in that way the signal would be marked. So, what it can give us? It can give us the global activity of the, the brain and how they are varying from point to point. Because we know that different parts of the brain they are doing different job through these connections we can find out that which part of the brain is getting activated when we are listening which part of the brain 
is actually getting more active when we are visualizing a scene which part of the brain is becoming more active when we are thinking or processing the that information. So, different part of the brain will actually get activated for different kind of that activities. So, that can be detected or marked for using this kind of system. Now, let us look at average EEG recording configuration. In this case that we get the reference is taken not from the two ear lobes, but we connect actually all the, the points which we are taking for the study and they are connected through some resistance and the midpoint of that resistance is taken as the reference. And with respect to that again we have the unipolar leads that is connected to one point we call that signal depending on the point where the that unipolar lead is connected that is F p 2, F p 8 or depending on that place. And here we get actually more uniform reference because now the potential is the reference potential is the average of all the, the points. So, with from a different reference we get the recording, but the nature of the signal would be similar to the previous unipolar connection, but as the signal would be different and to depict that fact that we have the reference is the average of all the, the leads this is called as average EEG recording configuration. Now, let us look at a one more different configuration. This is bipolar EEG recording configuration. In this case the simple two actually leads are taken positive and negative and as we connect it at two points as marked by the 1020 system we get the the potential or the, the potential difference of these two points like here the first case it is a difference of potential of it is a difference of potential of that fp2 and fp8 the next one is in between fp8 and t4 the third one is in between T4 and T6. Here the T4 and T6 are there and here it is in between the T6 and O2. Now, the question could be that why do we need to take so many configurations? The reason is that they depict actually different kind of thing in the brain. That when we have some local activity, the local activities can be detected more easily using the bipolar leads. For example, a tumor has actually grown in part of the, the brain. Now, we can detect that with bipolar lead, not only the detection, we can get the that locality of it using the bipolar lead because the two leads are close to each other and we know that the within this space the signal is coming which that kind of quantization or the localization is not possible using the that unipolar lead or the average lead configuration. So, for diagnostic purpose the bi bipolar lead it sometimes is more useful. 
Now, let us move ahead and see that how the EEG signal looks like. The first thing that to note that when we told about the ECG signal, ECG signal is having much higher strength, it was in millivolt range. Now, the EEG signal it is coming in micro volt range. So, these are much more weak signal, but we see that the signal bandwidth is also little more and the signals they do not have nice clean shape like the ECG signal. So, primarily that the EEG signal the it is classified in terms of the frequency band just like in uh, our electrical engineering we use the band pass signal and we tell that within this band we have this signal that is the way that EEG signals are depicted. In the lowest level we get the delta wave that is in between 0.5 to 4 hertz usually we get it in the deep sleep. So, if you get into the deep sleep we will get this signal. Also, when the person is awake, we may get the delta wave if there is some abnormality like a lesion has developed. What we call as mass is known as or termed as lesion in the medical science and the next band we get that is the the theta wave it is in between the 4 to 8 hertz and we get it in sleep also it can come in depression or for metabolic disorder if some of us are put under the eeg and this theta wave is detected that means, either we are sleeping, we are not doing our job or we are having some kind of disorder like depression. Next we get the alpha signal where the, the signal predominantly is with uh, from point uh, 8 to 13 hertz. Now, what it means that that within 8 to 13 hertz the maximum energy of the signal would be located. It does not mean no signal energy would be there beyond that, but the primary concentration of the energy maximum amount of energy would be there within this boundary 8 to 13 hertz for alpha and when we are awake at relaxation. So, we should emit alpha wave. So, now if the electrodes are connected on our brain we are supposed to give actually alpha wave. Some of us who are processing the signal at more carefully may also give the, the beta wave that is in between 13 to 22 hertz. That means, within this band we will have maximum energy of the signal. If we are awake at activity we are doing the processing of the signal we are thinking. So, then it can emit the beta wave. The next part is that we get the gamma 1, the gamma 1 it starts from 22 to 30 hertz, hertz in higher mental activity or visualization. Okay. So, if you try to visualize anything 
So, the mental processing not only increases, but it gives rise to increase in the frequency of the the signal it emits. So, we get the actually gamma wave. So, from our electrode if we get the gamma wave we can also get that at this moment we are not listening to the the lecture, but we may be visualizing something else. So, this is the the broad description of the EEG. Now, it does not mean that there is no pattern is detected in the EEG signal, there are patterns, but these are the the primary the classes of the signal, these signals that alpha, beta, then uh, theta, delta, gamma. So, these five they are the main classes and apart from that for different kind of special activity we can have some actually signals where we can get some shape and those things will uh, cover later. Now, let us look at some of the applications of EEG or in other words why at all we would look at the EEG signals. The first thing is anesthetic level during the operation it is very important that the patient should be sedated. So, that the senses are not working otherwise due to the pain of the operation the, the person may expire the, the person may not be able to bear that amount of pain and due to that shock the person may actually expire. So, it is very important to know that the person is sedated sufficiently, but at the same time we need to be careful that the person should not be subdued to that level that it cannot be actually that person cannot be recovered back. That means, after the operation is over again we need to get rid of the actually that anesthetic and the person should again come back to his senses or her senses. So, that also is an important part. So, we need to very carefully monitor and control the level of the anesthesis and that can be done by the EEG. We know that at deep sleep it gives that delta wave. So, we can look at that that how much percentage of the the total signal it is in that delta wave through that we can get that level of actually the anesthesis and we need to control that and monitor that throughout the period of operation. Next we look at epilepsy. Now, epilepsy is a disease which commonly known as that the person they have a tendency to collapse and uh, that it could be very dangerous especially if the person is uh, driving or uh, on the roads or very near to a moving machine. Now, that because we need to be careful and diagnose that person that why that uh, the person suddenly lost the senses and again he is recovering that the, the senses and becoming normal. So, that tendency can be found that looking at the EEG in, in the EEG if we get some spike that suggests that this person has a tendency to have epilepsy or epileptic tendencies we can say. So, that again EEG can come to the rescue it can tell us that whether this person has a epileptic tendency or not. And if the that person is medicated 
we can expect that those tendencies should go again instead of waiting till that person again gets fainted and have an another risky affair we can monitor that using the EEG and get the, the number of spikes whether that has reduced and has become minimal and the patient is safe enough to do the day to day activity. So, that is another application. Third is the brain injury. Sometimes the people have accident while driving or some other way. Now, whether the brain is working properly or not, each of the lobe they are responding to the stimulus or not that can be checked through the EEG. What could be the task? For example, one patient is lying that if we want to get that whether that, uh, that listening comprehension is working fine, we can ask that person to count the number of actually the bells. So, that the lobe responsible for listening, hearing that bell would get actually activated and the brain will be eagerly waiting again when that signal will come. Now, there could be a little more change in the activity, there could be two kinds of signal, one could be of lower frequency and other for higher frequency and the patient may be asked that okay, you count only the one which is having the higher frequency. Now, the patient has to not only listen to that, they need to process that thing that whether it is high frequency or low frequency in that relative scale through his or her senses and then count it and also decide that whether in this case you will increment the count or not. So, that in case of brain injury that such kind of function if it is affected we know that that particular lobe is getting affected and injury is limited there. Next thing could be tumor. Again, when the tumor grows, it actually affects the that activity of that region. So, through the experiments of stimulus, we can get that. The other thing is that we can use that bipolar lead configuration and detect that when the person is awake, whether we are getting the delta wave. That also can help us to find out that location of the tumor or lesion. Again, we can think of other activity like alertness monitoring. The alertness is very important for any task, whatever we are doing, we need to be alert, uh, alert and attentive. Now, in some work, this becomes even more crucial. For example, a truck driver is driving a very good big truck. If that person becomes drowsy, they may actually get into the, the pavement and kill so many pedestrians. Or think of a pilot actually uh, is on the that fighter aircraft. Now, every moment they have to take so many actions and monitor so many signals. If the person cannot take that load, becomes fatigue, then we can actually have accident at any time. So, in those cases it is important to monitor the alertness level of the, the person and that is possible through EEG. Next, comes monitoring during surgery that if it is a brain say uh, surgery, if the surgery is going in the brain, then you may be interested that whether the functionality of that part 
is maintained or it is getting impaired by your operation. So, what can be done that you could give the signals and monitor the EEG to know whether you are getting the response or not. Because the person is sedated, the person would not be able to tell that yes, I can hear the bell or so, but EEG will tell that the human senses they are able to get some signal and that is actually that has reached up to the brain. Again as it can look at the different functions of the, the brain, it can help us to quantify the effect of the exercise like yoga. In case of yoga, the claims are that our mind becomes more tranquil and peaceful, we enjoy more. Now, all these things are the claims made by the, the people who practices yoga. If all on a sudden one new person start that, he will not be able to get that benefit immediately and thereby it is difficult to quantify or ascertain in a quantitative way that is there any benefit of yoga or whatever the claims are made are they true or false. Now, as EEG acts as a probe to get the brain activity, we can actually get that whether through yoga or through meditation, we are getting more peace because some of the lobes becomes more activated when we are enjoying something. So, using that EEG again we can do that and uh, that they, thereby we can actually monitor the efficacy of yoga or as an individual we can say that how much benefit we are getting out of the meditation or yoga. So, that is about the application of EEG. Now, thank you.